this isn't easy for me to admit I've got a fire Hey guys, um, I'm Kemwell and I'm Kelsey We're from Belize, uh, we're located in the Caribbean We're a small country in the Caribbean and Central America, we're classified as both um, we are a country of 350,000 people in population and growing. We, the country is split up into six districts. There is the far north in Corozal, then there is Orange Walk, Belize, Cayo, Stand Creek, and Toledo. Um, we are filled with many cultures. There are so many people come here because it seems to be like a bridge between North America and South America. So there's a perfect balance of almost all the cultures on this side of the world. We're Creole, Mestizo, Maya, Mayans, Hispanic, Hispanic Black, Black, White. <laughs> all colors, all races, they just live together in Belize and it's all together like a melt. A lot of people call it the melting pot of cultures. And um, it's funny how Belize started out because we weren't originally called Belize at first. We were called British Honduras because yeah. we were under the British. The British are coming. The British are coming. <laughs> but um, we were a British colony. Yeah, we were a British colony um, way, way back in the days. But it didn't start off that way. It kind of started off with these nomad groups. One called the Tainas and Kalinagos, like way when there was ice on this side of the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there was this long like stretch of water called the Bering Strait that was frozen over. And yeah. because these groups followed um, herds of mammoth to eat and get their clothing and everything, you know, they ended up crossing over the Bering Strait during the Ice Age. And then when that ice melted, they were kind of stuck on this side of the world. So... Central America became their home. But people that were already on this side of the world were the Aztecs, the Incas, yeah. and the Mayans. There were already groups that had settled here. Well, the Aztecs and the Incas were more like on Venezuelan soil, whatever yeah. you want to call it. But the Mayans the were more settled here. But the Tainas and the Cananagos were kind of, how do I say this about offending anybody that might have Taino or Cananago culture? <laughs> well, they were kind of rough. I'll, I'll just put it like that. Because the Mayans were more quiet, timid, you know, very to Kept themselves. To their corners, yeah. But the Tainas and Kalanagos were very, well, I would They were say, dominant. Yeah, I wouldn't say, I was going to say barbaric, but that's a much better word. <laughs> they were dominant. They, they were wanted dominant. to um, expand their territories. Yeah. And, you know, they started to multiply, like, multiply mm -hmm. like, multiply <laughs> and they kind of became the dominant group over the Mayans and the Mayans went more to the center of Belize and the Tainas and Kalanagas the indigenous people that's mm -hmm. what they were called made up the greater part of Belize and it wasn't until like in the 1400s 1500s when the Europeans came yeah and you know, these people who have never seen, quote unquote, white men, yeah. you know, never seen horses, never seen boats, never seen carriages, never certain seen clothes, never seen, well, yeah, certain clothes. Yeah, like cotton and... Because a lot of them, the women kind of just walked around with like a loincloth around them, nothing even to cover the top. Like animal men, skin. Animal skin. Yeah. And, you know, here, these people come with their huge weapons and cannons and guns and horses and dogs and... You know, they thought they could win the fight, and they were sadly mistaken. <laughs> and the Europeans came and completely trampled over them, and completely took over, enslaved them, had them picking cotton, planting sugar, yeah. um, even diving for pearls. Yeah. A lot of them couldn't really swim, so they would end up dying because they didn't know how to hold their breath for so long. And it would just get worse and worse and worse because the Europeans kept demanding more. Like, we want more. Because from the whole reason why they came is because this they side wanted. of the world was supposed to be rich in resource. So they were expecting to find gold and silver and, you know, spices. Yeah. But the thing is, they were looking for the East. 
and they thought that what they found here was the ink when they were they were actually looking for like India, India and that China, side of the world, that side, like yeah. you know where you know they were they was rich in spices and stuff like that. But here it's more just a bunch of coconuts, some some mangoes, <laughs> cotton, sugar. You know that's all you could really find here. You'd probably find some gold every now and again, but yeah. that would be like that would that would be rare. That would be like finding oil. Yeah. Well, we did have oil, but they didn't oil. at the wrong that time. They didn't really know about oil and how to properly mine it and dig for it and stuff like that. But yeah, that enslavement went on for a long period of time until finally the specifically the Kalinagos were the more um, dominant group that got kind of sick of it, and constantly there are many uprisings, yeah. many fights. You know, to gain back control, but you know, just imagine a cat and a spear. Which one do you think wins? One overpowers the other easily. <laughs> so I think you can tell who kept losing. And even some of the Europeans started bringing in because they realized, okay, these indigenous people work too slow and they can't even really speak English that well. That's how Creole came about and the different versions like patois and stuff like that yeah because you know they had to find some way to communicate to these people because like that's where the main language of belize you hear the locals speak creole english broken english yeah um and some of the others because then they brought in other people to other indigenous groups from like the surrounding islands like from haiti from from even Cuba, as like far from, as Africa, yeah, as far as Africa, like a whole bunch of people they were just bringing in to try and do all the work that they could have just did themselves. But <laughs> you know, that's how you got domestic slaves, field slaves. Mm -hmm. You know, they had different rankings, and you know, they started to realize that the slave to European ratio was becoming like ten to one. Mm -hmm. So they were slowly getting outnumbered in workers and masters. And it was around that time when everyone realized, hey, we outnumber all y'all. <laughs> we can do something about it now. And then the revolt became more and more dominant. The yeah. domestic slaves starting to get braver, starting to poison their masters, yes. putting like rat poison or something yeah. in their food, and then they would get sick slowly. But they would do it slowly. They wouldn't just put a huge amount at one time. And then. I think it was in the 1700s that there was this one domestic slave, I cannot remember her name, but she had learned how to read and she had read in her master's newspaper about an emancipation bill being denied for each and every person that was enslaved under the Europeans. And because she knew about that, she got upset like, so we had a chance to freedom and they're denying it? And you know she spread word toward all the sal um, salvation slave planes, the slaves, <laughs> the slave planes, and that started a huge revolution, and they finally won. Um, but they had only one rights to have the Emancipation Bill be passed, and even so, with that bill, you still had to pay for it. So you had to pay for your freedom. So you still had to work. Someone had to buy you to set you free. You had to work a good amount of time to be able to buy your freedom, and. Even if you were able to buy your freedom, what now? Because, you know, no, no. the Europeans still didn't really treat them as, as the same ranking as them. Yeah. So it was still like, okay, I got freedom now, what now? You don't have to work, but you still have to find a way to eat, um, feed your families if you had families. And uh, fast forwarding to like the 1800s, I think that was when, I think if Cameron can correct me if I'm wrong, that's when the battle between the Bayman. It was 1798. So yeah, roughly around 1800, two years, and at 1798 there was a there was a battle. It was between mainly well, she's the history major, but it was what it's called um, the Battle of Saint George's Key. It was mainly a a war for the land of Belize because what had happened was was um, people had started to bring in more slaves, different slaves. And to cut logwood in Belize, because Belize mm -hmm. is rich in forestry, so there's a lot of um, trees. As you can see, it's a lot of jungle. <laughs> it was rich in mahogany. Yeah. And they, they would go into the parts of the forest, and they would cut, send, bring in the slaves to cut the mahogany, float them down the river. And then one day, one thing led to another, and the war came. 
and the, it was between the British and the Spanish masters. So basically, the slaves' masters were, were kind of fighting for them, in a sense. Yeah. Because when, they, re, they saw the injustice and they wanted to help. Because there was kind of a gap. Like when they were cutting long wood, they would try to mix the indigenous people, the other people they brought in from Africa, the East Indians, with mm-hmm. the British women that they brought in from Britain to work with them. There was still kind of a divide. But when the British started to rise up and fight against the Spaniards and the Europeans, the other indigenous people were like, hey, you know, if we join in, there's a possibility that we could win. And they did. Because at that time, <laughs> England became one of the most powerful countries in the world. Yeah. So, and England was, was, tech, was kind of a peacemaker. They would send resources to help other countries. So, even though they couldn't do anything to help the slave situation at, at, a, um, at an instant, they did stuff to help things happen over time. And that led to the Battle of St. George's Key. And long story short, we won. We won. And that's how we got the land. So slavery was becoming diminished. And that's how that ended that era. Everyone began to take their own corners in Belize. Yeah. Um, the Spanish, the Hispanics, you would see them mostly in Kaya or Orinjuac or Corozal. They, you would find the Creoles and the Amalaks and the Africans and people of color around in Belize City. They're scattered everywhere, but you would find a lot of them in the Belize district. Yeah. Um, and Stan Creek. And Stan Creek. Toledo, you would find a lot of the East Indians. You would and find them in Toledo and, and the Mayans. And in Toledo and Orange Corazal. Where the cane fields are in Orange Rock, yeah. Because they were farmers. Each one of them had different traits. And that's, that's where the culture started to disperse into the country of Belize. And even some of the stuff from slavery, we still kind of kept, not saying that we're still in bondage, do not get me wrong, but I mean, some of the stuff like we used to plant, like cane, cotton, coffee, some plantations do plant coffee. Bananas. Are still citrus, citrus, rice. We still have those today, big agricultural plots and farms where we plant all these things and you know, it's a good source of income for the country. That is one of the main sources of income for the company. It's the imports and exports. Yeah. Especially mm-hmm. sugar. Sugar is sugar our biggest is our biggest income. Because we have huge sugar cane fields. Well, fields. <laughs> but yeah. After the battle, it's more of peaceful, somewhat peaceful living going into the 1900s. Yeah. Up until recently in 1981, People have been starting to realize that Belize, Belize should be an independent nation. So, so from there, there was this guy, this man, George George Cato Price, George Price. He was the founder of the nation. He led everything, everyone, and the plan to get Belize into motion to become an independent nation. So he eventually became the first prime minister. And that's when, in September 21st, in 1981, we became an independent nation and we got our independence from England, Great Britain. From there, it's, it's more common knowledge now, like, our government system is modeled after the, the way the English government system works. Like, the, the government still reports to the Queen, the Governor General, he still, he's, he works for the Queen, so he oversees the government. He's the one that has to pass laws, so his signature is what makes the bill becomes a law. There's the government, we have a prime minister, and then there's the senate and the cabinet, and the house of representatives. Then we have a judiciary system and a legislative system to create laws, and that's how all that um, works. There's, there is, what else? Yeah, from there, there's a lot of other little details, but we've been here all day. Yeah, <laughs> covered From day. there, that's where Belize became until now, the independent nation. There are two major political parties. There's the United Democratic Party, and then there's the People's United Party. So those are the two people that go head to head. Two parties that go head to head to see who would run the country of Belize in government. The party that started Belize off was the People's United Party, and we're currently under the United Democratic Party. That's how that one is. 
Um, let me see. Belize has, ha has had all male prime ministers currently. That's how that is. Um, apart from that, that's how history is. Stuff about Belize now. Like, we don't, we don't have like four seasons, it, especially in the Caribbean and apart from the equator and the tropics. There's only two seasons, it's dry. Wet and dry. Wet and dry. It's either hot or it's raining. There's no in between. <laughs> There's no in between. We don't have snow or hail or anything like that. Well, so. we do have hail. Sometimes. It's very, very rare. It's like when it's really hot, it's weird like that, I know, but it's like when there's extreme temperatures of heat and all of a sudden you'd see storm clouds. Sometimes you'd see a couple hail. Like um, last month there was a hail storm in Belmopan. Belize is set up in a way that's weird. Like as you reach Toledo, it's always raining. It's always raining. It's the way. It's I guess it's the way the density is set up. It's not just like rain. It's like thunderstorm rain and like flood, lightning, thunder, yeah. torrential rain. Yeah, it's it's a little flood prone. So like whenever. There's a hurricane headed our way, they would evacuate the coast and down south because like they are easy to get flooded out. Belize is an area that's mainly an English speaking country, but there's a there are tons of English languages in Belize. There's Spanish, there's Mayan, Garifuna. And they have different types of languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are three types of the Mayan languages. There's Yucatec, Keche, Keche and Mopan. So they each speak a different version of the Mayan language to their respective cultures. There are the Garfuna, they, they speak um, Garfuna. Well, actually the people... Yeah, the people are called... Garinago. Yeah. And the language is, is Garfuna. Garfuna. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that. Yeah. They kind of... Mix up the names. Exactly. Garfunas are mainly from Africa. They are descendants of Africans. And they were... They came to Belize to escape slavery. They were from the motherland. They came to ex escape slavery and they traveled through the Caribbean and they each stopped off of the different countries. Some stopped at St. Vincent and the Grenadines, some stopped off in Guyana, and some kept going, going with um, Honduras and then they stopped in Belize. So we were the last stop. Um, <laughs> yeah. They stopped. They came to Belize on November 19th. So it's a day as mm. Garifuna National Garifuna Settlement, Settlement Day, as we they recognize when they came in. So they all came in on boats, waving coconut leaves, singing because they were happy playing to playing drums. Yeah, playing drums. They were happy to escape slavery. So they came celebrating because they found a land that welcomed them, and a land that will not harm them or judge them or anything. Just settle and realize it's a place of refu refuge. What else? There's that's the Garfuna. Then there's the Mestizo. Those are they are spread about all over Belize, but you mostly find them in, like I said, in Corozal, Orange Rock, and Cayo. There's they speak mostly Spanish, mostly Spanish. So also there's a fun fact like the way Belize is set up, you would find a lot of people here. So like tourists and stuff like that, they would come to Belize and they would they would go to this place called the tourist village, they just call it the tourist village. So it's weird, all the, um, the cruise ships and the planes would land. It's where everyone would meet before they go to like on tours or to their hotels. And from there, everyone is like um, a bridge. We call it a bridge because you'd find Americans, you'd find um, Guatemalans, Mexicans, people from the Caribbean, Chinese. There's a lot of Chinese settlers here in Belize. They, you, if you'd ask a, a Chinese person or Asian person, yeah, Asian. an Asian person, where they came from, they are, or why they came to Belize, they would tell you they came here to find a better life. They are very discreet about how they settled here. But if you look around, you'd see a lot of Chinese restaurants. There aren't much local restaurants, but there are local restaurants. They came and you, they came for business, and they've helped the country. They've helped the country a lot. A lot in financial help so it's the funny thing is that Belize is the where Belize is it's between Mexico Guatemala and then there's Honduras and we're the only country out of this region that speaks English 
as a main language, yeah, as a first, as a first language. language. So like every other country is a Spanish speaking country, but Belize is classified as an English speaking country. So you could come here and speak English freely and we would we would understand. <laughs> we would understand. How did y'all come to accept Christ, but then also how did your ancestors and everything come to accept Christ or God? I know if you know that story and anything like how either what gods they believed in back then and how that transpired um, and all that. Well, the different cultures believe in believe in their respective gods. Because like the mestizo are Catholic, right? It depends. Because in our history class, my teacher went into extensive stuff of talking about religion and the different cultures. But, um, there's a lot. But the Mayans specifically had many, many yeah, gods. Yeah, they had many gods. Um, like, gods that they would sacrifice they would, stuff to. They would because sometimes like, they believed in a sacrifice. rain god. Yeah, rain god, uh, corn god, uh, crop god, uh, fertility god, sun god. Um, and all these gods require different sacrifices for different mm -hmm. conditions. So like if they wanted to rain because it's been in drought for so long, they make a sacrifice to the rain god. Or, you know, if their fields and their crops were dying, then they'd make a sacrifice to the crop god. Like different sacrifices for yeah. all kinds of stuff. Um, the indigenous people had gods as well, but they... Yeah, they were kind of like the Mayans too as well. They had a lot of different gods, but their sacrifices were almost always human sacrifices. Sometimes the Mayan would just sacrifice like crops or mm -hmm. different stuff, but they, like the Tainas and the Kalanagos, most of the time it was human sacrifices. And when the Europeans came, they, you know, they labeled that as taboo, as barbaric, yeah. you know, that we need to show them the way. So they would basically burn down all their places of mm -hmm. sacrifice um, where they used to worship their mm -hmm. idols and build, have them build churches that they couldn't even go into. Mm -hmm. Like that, that blew my mind. I'm like, you're completely changing, trying to change these people's way of life, but you're not even allowing them to see your God. And back then, the Europeans' versions of crusades were wars. Like that, it wasn't like mm -hmm. our modern day version of a crusade. Like have a guest speaker, have someone doing worship. You know, let's get all hyped up. Back then, it was people crusades were violent with yeah. like you know the um, scripts with scriptures. You know, basically, kind of like you are all going to hell if you don't follow God. And they would come with their spears and their swords. You know, killing anyone that doesn't want to bow down to yeah. their God. And you know, a lot of the slaves kind of just submit to it, just so that they wouldn't die. And they didn't really know what a loving God looked like. They just knew what the white man's God looked like. And, you know, it was hard. Very few really adapted that truth of what God really looks like. It was when the same Garifuna people and Africans came when they brought their religion, which was Baptist. There was many yeah, Baptists, yeah. you know, they were really you know, hyper energetic, like when organ you step into their churches, the like everyone is clapping, you know, yeah. that, that dancing and, you know, all the slaves are like, hey, this, this, this looks really good because, like compared to what's going on. Because what, what they were shown is that God is someone who is waiting with a light. Like, yeah. Like you. If you step out of line and what this culture is saying is that God brings peace and happiness and he can have fun. Yeah. <laughs> So that, that's where everyone converted and, and it slowly went on a journey to Christianity. Yeah. And what people were these again that did it? The Garifuna. Yeah, the Garifuna. And they're the ones from Africa. They are the ones that came from Africa. Yeah, all the different groups from Africa. It's not just Garifuna, but all the yeah. different groups from Africa brought there were that them. And there were a bunch of different... It's a question like the group from Africa, like they weren't slaves or anything, they just got on boats from Africa and just... They came escaped here, slavery. They escaped, they escaped, they escaped oh, okay. slavery. Yeah, and they came here. Slavery from Africa or different islands around like the Caribbean or different all different islands, islands yeah. Because okay. a lot of them, they're the same culture. They call these, they call different names, but they all came from one place and yeah. one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they all basically came from the same part of the world. Over there. Yeah. Some still came and you know got captured into slavery, but mm -hmm. most of them kind of found their way. They're like, okay, we know what this looks like. We're not doing it again, mm -hmm. and we know how to hide. Because a lot of the stuff that they did, they kind of had to do it hidden. Because mm -hmm. if the Europeans saw them, they would come and burn down yeah. their church or whatever, their place of worship, their drums, everything, and put them back into bondage. The Garifunas weren't completely Christianity, but they do believe in the idea of a God, that God is here to help and protect, and even though he disciplines you, but they do believe that God is there with you. So 
like for example why they aren't fully Christian is because they um they have this ritual that they do for families that it's called the Dogo. And yeah. yeah, so they have these huge temples that they take cocoon leaves and they would set up um, wooden rods and build huge, huge pray they're pretty houses. And if you look if you ever get the um chance to see how it is to make the building it's a pretty tedious task. But so we were talking about the Garifuna ritual, how they were slowly getting towards Christianity and church and the Catholic and how God actually works. But they still do this today actually. Today in in today's day. They um they have this ritual for the families that whenever someone dies they um or their birthday or something comes up. There's something that goes on behind the scenes that gathers the entire family, but it's mainly a ritual to visit your family that died. And they come to visit you, so you would take a drink of, I think it was rum, and they would play the drums and they would start singing a song, talking about family, and the spirit of the family member. You would go, but you wouldn't know which family member would visit you. This, I know this because my aunt is Garifuna, and she had to go to one. So she um she said you if you when you took when you drank the rum of the family member was supposed to come visit you and tell you a message so he'll like tell you I'm proud of you or I love you tell my family hi tell them I'm okay and then there would sometimes be times like the it would get crazy and like um I'm not okay stuff like that it would basically a concept of heaven and hell but that's how that would work there's this thing that. If you deny the invitation to go, you would call on like sickness or stuff on yourself. So in some cases, it actually, it's like a curse. But until you say yes to go, then your, cold, your sickness would leave. So some, some would have severe pain. Some would have like upset stomach and cramps and all that. But it would be just any regular stuff. It would be intense. So until you say yes to the invitation, then the pain and the sickness would leave. And then you would, you would go and experience and then come back. But... Some, they still do it today, but it's not something publicized, it's something for the yes. family. Yeah, it's not something. Mm. Chris, what, um, so after everyone had their own individual religions, then mission trips started to come in. People, missionaries, mission teams, mission teams I'm sorry. Mission teams, not only from the US, but I think like from neighboring countries as well. Because Guatemala is relatively a believe in God, Mexico the same. So most naturally they would overflow into Belize and that's how Belize started to adopt the Christian mindset so that's when they started to put laws in place based on moral values that a Christian man would, would do and stuff like that they just recently like because the Belize is influenced by the US like they open up to the LGBT community so some of them are more free to be themselves and stuff like that but if it wasn't for the influence, I would say they would still stay on the um the Christian based, the godly based rules and laws and then each I think the Garifuna are the mo um is the culture that has the most of its own beliefs mm. aside from the Mayans. I think the Mayans and the Garifuna are kind of neck to neck when it comes to culture, religion, food beliefs, clothing, everything. I honestly feel like they're like right here. But I feel like the Garifuna are more vocal mm -hmm. about their beliefs, about their culture on a whole. They're they're very proud of who they are yeah, and the they're Garifuna not afraid to, you know, voice it and have yeah, you know, invite everyone else to celebrate in on it. Some of the Mayan culture is kinda of more reserved. Yeah, they like, keep things that in in their circle. Yeah. Yeah. So they keep the culture and the rituals to themselves. Yeah. When, I'm not really sure if they still carry out their rituals. Like it was the Garifuna that had fought hard to have, you know, their own special holiday when like the Mestizo and the Mayans are like yeah. they really don't care. <laughs> like if we have a day, even though we were here like a long time ago, you know, they don't mind being just on the background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you said like the Garifuna's. The Garifuna. Garifuna. They are Christian but they aren't Christian, so like you they in a, yeah, in a sense, because they believe in the concept of God, mm -hmm. and they believe in the concept of heaven and hell. But they also, because it wouldn't be a full Christian religion 
because of the, their other beliefs. Mm-hmm. And like the, with their, their connection rituals. to the spirit world. Yeah, because like they believe they have direct dead. access to connect with their, um, their ancestors based they, on, the, on the time of the year and their, their rituals. And they're, um, there's this, I don't know if you want to mention it, no. but this ritual that sometimes, that, that sparked from it, um, voodoo, where they would use oh, yeah, they do that. like a doll and with connected with maybe the hair of somebody or a fingernail or some kind of DNA. It's and not only just a, a, a witchcraft thing, it stems from a culture. Yeah. And then so that, that's what kind of contradicts and dilutes the Christian over yeah. and their religion. Because they believe they, um, if someone does them wrong, they have the right to correct it, correct it <laughs> with the spells or the curses and whatever. Do they believe in Jesus or like they, just they like, believe in a sovereign God? Mm-hmm. They don't believe. They don't believe in Jesus in itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it would be kind of an injustice to generalize everybody because there are few. Yeah, there are few like the Garifuna that you know really do have that connection with God. Because we know even some, yeah even though they might have they have may have grown up in that background with you know all those rituals and beliefs you know they still at the end of the day, they have their own choice to make when yeah. they get older. So it's not like they are. Um, forced to stay in their own beliefs. They are free to move and go as they please. Yeah. But one thing with Garfunas on a whole, they are proud to be who they are. They love their culture and they love yeah. their heritage. Where they came from to where they are now, that's what keeps all of them together. The fact that they all came up together. Yeah. Another thing would be the food. Like each culture has their own like dish that you would know them for. Like the Garfuna are known for this dish called huduk. It's basically um fish mashed plantain and coconut milk it's like a soup yeah it's really really good so it's like they would take a habanero pepper bust it and leave it in the soup and it would get spicy so we would eat the soup with um the mashed plantains and you eat the fish and it's really really good and the way they mash the plantain is like almost like a huge butter turner if you know mm-hmm. what a butter turner looks like it's a huge wooden bowl that's kind of like i forget how they call it no. and they would use a huge wooden Force and just mash it, mash it, mash it, and it's a really tedious process trying to get everything all mashed up together. But the final product is really good. Yeah. Then the mestizo are really known for like basically Spanish food. The same Spanish food you would see in um, Mexico or Guatemala, the same you would see all over. Mm-hmm. So it would be tacos, um, caldo, or soup. Empanadas. Empanadas, tamales, sabutes, stuff like that. Corn. They're very corn based. Um, the East Indians are like curry and um, yellow ginger. They're spice. They're, they're spicy. There's all seasoning in their food. So they would, you would see white rice, kuhun cabbage. Kuhun cabbage is um, these same kuhun trees. If you cut into the root and the center of it, there is a there is a I don't know what you call it. It looks like cabbage really. And it's a big like at the center of the tree and they would cut it up, cut up pieces and cut it up and it looks just like cabbage and it tastes really good. It tastes similar to cabbage and they would put um, yellow ginger seasoning and they would put it up with chicken and make it all together like a stew. Mm-hmm. And that's what would they would eat. That's what you know the East Indians for they make anything with curry or yellow ginger. Um, um. Garifuna, also Garifuna and Creole is mostly starch. Yeah. Um, rice. Like, right, Belizeans love rice and beans, chicken and salad. Like, that's I think that's our staple food. Yeah. Um, potatoes, potato salad. Um, boil up. Boil up is mm. another Garifuna dish. It's stew fish. Basically, it's like a whole melting pot of food. It's stew fish. Dumpling, ground food. food like cassava, cocoa, um, plantain, potato, potato um, made with this like tomato sauce. Well, some make this tomato sauce to pour over it and you eat it with rice. And the fish is that you make with it is typically stewed. Yeah, and you could either eat it with fish or pigtail. Yeah, but I've seen most make it with fish because it just yeah. Korea, you could go to any Belizean local restaurant. And they will always have rice, beans, chicken, and salad. That's, that's like a staple, standard food for Belizean. And I, I've noticed across the Caribbean too, rice and beans, the staples 
it's like very universal in the Caribbean. And I think that also kind of stemmed from slave, from slavery kind of because their Russians, what they would get for food would be pigtail, mm -hmm. um, either salt fish or salt beef, plantain, cassava, and a cup of rice and a cup of beans. So starchy stuff, and they probably only get fed once a day, so that's why they would give them starchy stuff so that they could have be enough full. energy. Yeah. For, well, not full, <laughs> but yeah. have enough energy for the entire day because they didn't really feed them three times a day. So I think that kind of stemmed over into what we eat now. Just in a lot more portions. I feel like Belize ends with a lot of carbs, a lot of starch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, True. Yeah. It's good. So. Yeah. A lot of the stuff, that if you go to the other any other Caribbean country or any other Caribbean region, you notice that like a lot of the traditions are the same and that blew my mind because last two years I went to Barbados and that that was really cool because I noticed like some of the things they do it's the same to what we do and in, even in the way we cook and some of the way we speak because I mean most of us were um, British colonies Barbados was a British colony Trinidad was a British colony um, Antigua and Barbuda a lot of those countries including Belize were British colonies and it, it's all to show that we're all connected and we aren't, we aren't that separated. So to go back to um, how did Belize become a Christian nation in, in a sense, it all stems back to where we came from. Because I believe the English were the ones that introduced Christianity when they, um, when was it, Christopher Columbus that introduced Christianity to the king, right? I think. I remember I heard that in some book. But it was, then, then they saw that this religion is work is good and it, and is real, so they started to spread. But they weren't. It was the first religion that was introduced here was Catholicism, mm -hmm. and it was when, like I had mentioned before, when Africans came from all over the place and they brought their. Who? Oh, I guess it's.